God's grace, his mercy, his peace be yours in abundance, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who are rich in the generosity of our God. This morning we focus on some words from the Apostle Paul recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the top of page 11 in the worship folder. We ask God's blessing upon us today as we remember uh, the great joy of serving in ministry alongside of him. Let us begin with a prayer. O oh Lord, bless our hearts and, and our lives through the power of your word, that as we are reminded of the riches of your grace that fill our hearts and lives, uh, we might use those riches to care for the needs of others. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Two men, actually two brothers, had one purpose, one goal, perhaps we might even say one dream. And it all culminated on that morning of December 17th uh, as uh, the, the cold and the bitterness sort of rolled in from the ocean and the, the winds were up to about 20 to 27 miles per hour. As I looked around, they noticed that only about five people had come to witness the launch. But after about three somewhat successful attempts, uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright's flyer became the first piloted powered machine to take flight about half a mile until the wind caught it. They were only about four years apart, but their preacher father described them as uh, inseparable twins and indispensable to each other. Others have described them as self-contained and industrious, hardworking uh, with tremendous energy. But as you read books about Wilbur and Orville, you'll also find they had their differences. They were unique in and of themselves. But the one thing they had the most in common was sort of a sense of unity and purpose and an unyielding determination. Right. They had set themselves a mission. And today, we benefit from them make, or reaching that goal. As the Apostle Paul sat in prison at, towards the end of his ministry, and he looks across the room and he sees that soldier who had been assigned to his cell that day, outfitted and geared up for duty that day, he thought to himself as he was writing his letter to the Philippians, well, I'm going to talk about how they are fellow Christian soldiers in God's army and that God had given them a mission. So as he writes his letter, he begins his, his opening words of introduction. Paul issues them a command that comes to them from God as their mission, as, as God's mission. He told them, whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens. Well, there sat Paul in a prison. He had no idea what was going to happen to him. But with great joy, excitement, and determination, unyielding determination, might we say, he serves God's people by reminding them throughout his book, his letter, that he will always rejoice, whatever happens. And he sort of explains it this way in verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, right? I'm going to live for Christ. To die is gain. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul recognized the wonderful plan, mission that God had given to him to serve his people. So his focus remained on that job of being a servant, a, a messenger of God's grace. He was able to remain focused on a purpose in life, a mission, to be instrument, an instrument of God's peace for his people. And as we think about our own lives and what's coming next, we recognize that's the same plan for you and me. As we look around the room, we see different talents and abilities, different ways in which God has equipped you to serve, to be enlisted in that mission. Now, the funny thing is, is God doesn't need you. 
He could do it all by himself. But by his grace, he's chosen you not only to be his child through the blood of Christ, he's chosen you to be a very instrument he will use to care for people. Remember the little boy? He brought his fish and bread. The disciples, uh, they were playing waiter and busboy as the people had their fill. Each and every day, Jesus turns to you and me, and he enlists us in this mission. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. So we ask ourselves, uh, what is the gospel worth to each of us? What is it worth that, to you that Jesus sacrificed himself to save you from yourself? To save you from your sinful, selfish attitudes? To save you from your oftentimes rebellious, unruly ways? What's that worth to you? What is it worth to you to know that God has simply declared you his holy child, even though sometimes on the outside it doesn't really look like it? What is it worth to you to know that when you die, your Heavenly Father is going to welcome you home into his kingdom? There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you could do. You don't have to reach a certain level of obedience to be a, a better Christian in order to get into heaven we know it's that gift, right? Purchased by the blood of Jesus. And that, we know, is what makes us rich. What is that uh, gospel worth? It's priceless. So Paul says, whatever happens, no matter what's going on around you, no matter what people say about you or do to you, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Eh, but we've heard that all the time, right? If we ask each other that question, what's your goal for today? Obviously, it's to do everything in the glory of God. But it's easier said than done many times. It's the Christian answer to give. It's, uh, it's safe because that's what the Bible tells us to say. What's, what's the reality, though, as we look at our lives? Conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? This past week, I spent uh, time in Michigan at the Synod Convention and enjoyed visiting with uh, many classmates, about a half dozen or so, and the class ahead of me, there must have been about a dozen guys there, so I uh, had to admit we probably stayed up a little too late one of the nights, but enjoyed the company. Um, one of the classmates was giving a devotion at the same convention, and he was telling the story about a conversation that he had with his 10-year-old daughter. And afterwards, I joked him, I says, I'm gonna steal that story, because I have a 10-year-old daughter too. Uh, but he goes on uh, to talk about how she came home from school one day, and she simply asked him, Daddy, uh, do you like being a pastor? And immediately he said he was horrified. Why would she ask that question? And he's scrambling in his mind to figure out, what is it that I did that gave her the impression that I don't like being a pastor? Or he was worried that maybe she overheard he and his wife talking about ministry and the frustrations and the challenges, maybe kind of complain a little bit about things. Why would, why would she ask me? She had never asked this question before. Was it uh, maybe the, the worried expressions on his face or maybe the, the, the stress that was in his tone of voice? He was worried that something had happened that spoke directly opposite of all the sermons he preached about how great it is the privilege to tell people about Jesus. Well, he, he sort of stalled for a moment, afraid of how she was going to answer his question, but he finally got the strength up to ask her, well, why do you ask? Innocently, she answered, well, it was part of my assignment from school. <laughs> But as he shared that story, he also confessed, and I would do so along with him, how horrifying for someone to react honestly in that way and openly that way. Do you really like being a Christian? Are there ways in which we act that give people the impression, well, we're, we're Christian by name, but it's not that much fun or whatever? Isn't it, wouldn't it be sort of shameful, or maybe isn't it shameful uh, to, to think that people might 
wonder or be surprised that we actually go to church every Sunday or as much as we can? Wouldn't it be embarrassing, has it been embarrassing, to find out the impression that you've left on people even though they know you're a Christian? It's easy to confess those things, but to live it? And even think on a bigger scale, how embarrassing to God. All he's done for us, all the times he's sort of bent over backwards to be patient with us, and that's the way we act. Whether it's an impression we left on people or things that people hear us say or do. As we go back to our focus today, I kind of wonder then, why would Jesus enlist us into his ministry? Why would he have us join alongside of him to care for people? And maybe even a, a bigger question, how in the world can he get anything done with us? Simple that we are, unfaithful that we are sometimes, untrusting, doubtful. Well, the Apostle Paul shares with us some encouraging words uh, that remind us of God's grace when we think about the impressions we've left on people or the things that we've said that haven't necessarily been positive. But he also reminds us of where our fuel comes from, how we are filled up with that love of God that empowers us to, to joyfully serve alongside of our Savior. We'll read the first couple of verses there from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul writes, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. And you and I are those poor in spirit, right? That we, we confess our sins, there's that sorrow over what we've done. He casts his gifts abroad to us, right? Forgiveness and grace, mercy each and every day. His righteousness, he goes on to quote, endures forever. We are beyond rich, Paul says. And what a blessing to know that and, and to have that richness of God's grace and his mercy. Some of you are fans and watch the Tour de France. You know that a man by the name of Christopher Froome or from, from England uh, won the Tour de France this year. I don't know a whole lot about it, but uh, I've discovered there are 21 stages in the race, and the individual winner then is the one who finishes it in the least amount of time. 84 hours, 46 minutes, and 14 seconds. Well, as I did some more research, I discovered uh, that um, sometimes, maybe most of the time, the winner, the individual winner, is determined by the stage in the mountains. And then they have five different stages of that mountain leg of the race. And they are rated, first of all, the fourth stage was sort of the easiest, and it kind of goes up to the first stage. And the final stage, is labeled HC. Now, pardon my French. Um, H O R S. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Ors, ors category. Well, ors means beyond. So this stage is beyond difficult. Now, let's give that label to our God, right? Beyond. Beyond comprehension, Paul says in the, uh, Philippians chapter 4, his peace which transcends our human understanding, we often hear. God is beyond what sinners would expect of him. God is beyond our human imagination as to how he deals with us, how he's patient with us, how he never changes, how he is in control of everything. I was watching a video about creation and the, the galaxies that are out there and the, the hundreds of millions of miles they can look out into space and find all these stars. It's beyond my human comprehension. But that's the type of love that gives us peace. And that's the type of love that we strive to give to others. Jesus modeled that in the gospel lesson. We strive to imitate him a love that's patient, a love that's gracious and merciful. And, and Paul assures us that that love will continue to flow into our hearts through God's word. Verse 10, he says, 
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Right? As we serve, serve others with love, that love, the, it will produce even more fruits. And finally, verse 11, he says, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We are beyond rich in Christ. Two men, two brothers, one goal, one purpose. What they had in common most of all is a unified purpose, unyielding determination. 200 plus men and women at Bethlehem, 200 plus brothers and sisters in Christ, loved by our God with a love that's beyond us. Paul says that is how God makes us rich beyond our imagination. That comforts us and soothes us, but also equips us and empowers us as he enlists us in his army, as he invites us to participate in that ministry so that he can use us as instruments of peace to care for the needs of people. That's why God, by his grace, invites us to serve with him. He doesn't need us, but he wants us to enjoy touching people's hearts and lives with a hug or with a kind word, with a letter, with words from our God, powerful words that heal and help, that empower that preserve people for eternity. You and I, we are beyond rich. The question is, how are we going to use those riches? God comforts you with the richness of his love, but may he lead us to think about that question more often. How can I use the riches of God today to thank my God and to serve people and to care for their needs? God bless you as you celebrate the answer to those questions and utilize opportunities to care for people and to thank your God. God grant you that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the peace of God which transcends goes beyond our human understanding will keep and guard your hearts through faith in Christ. Amen.